This is 21 This Week. I'm Mark Unkefer, sitting in for Casey Aiken. Coming up next, a changing of the guard at the boards of election. With crime stats up, it's help wanted at the county's police department. And is the state education superintendent, Suit Chaudhry, the right choice for the Kerwin blueprint? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former Maryland delegate and attorney, Marise Morales, and fellow attorney, but Republican attorney, Jim Shalek. Stay tuned for these stories and more on 21 This Week next. Welcome back to 21 This Week. Jim, welcome back to the show as well. You've been a panelist uh, for a number of years, uh, and then you were president of the uh, County Board of uh, Election and the candidate for Attorney General, uh, so you weren't on the show. Uh, When was your first appearance? 1994, and it's been fun. It really has. (laughs) We had cameras back then? (laughs) We did. (laughs) Well, speaking speaking of that, we're glad to have you back. It's been uh, almost 30 years since your first appearance. And so we appreciate the fact that you've been um, available for so many of our, our shows. Going back, I mean, you were on the Board of Elections and we now have a changing of the guards taking place at the Boards of Election, both with new members coming in uh, for the next four years and also at the state level with state administrator, uh, Linda Lamone retiring. Marise, over the last couple of years, mail-in uh, voting has increasingly been a, um, uh, a factor. As a candidate, are you satisfied with the right protections being in place? Absolutely, 100%. I have total confidence um, in the state and the County Board of Elections. Um, I think we are leading the country in creating a system that the public can trust in. Um, and, you know, as there are growing pains, I think we have uh, led with, you know, what is lawfully accurate and what the options are when, they, when a candidate, you know, did ask for a recount, et cetera. And I think the transparency and the patience behind it, and I think the resources too, really show that we do prioritize making voting as accessible as possible for our seniors, for individuals who may be abroad, but are still, uh, you know, c- citizens and residents of our communities. Sure. Now, one of the complaints that you sometimes hear from candidates or people who are going door to door is that the voter rolls aren't up to date, that people have moved, they've died, and they haven't voted in a while, but they continue on the rolls. Is that an area that you've got some concerns about? I think there's always going to be an um, area of improvement. And I think to the extent that the state, um, again, you know, appropriates the funds and we have the resources to make those corrections, I think obviously it it will bolster the confidence in that, you know, those uh, voting avenues. Sure. Jim, what advice do you have for the new uh, state election administrator? By the way, they appointed Jared DeMarinis, who was in charge of candidate and campaign financing. Excellent choice. Excellent choice. He'll do a great job. And that was, I'm really happy that the state board did that unanimously. My advice is, even though they're all activists, or everybody on the on election board comes from their respective political parties through a political appointment, once they get sworn in, they have to disrobe their political affiliations and act independently and act together in the benefit and for the benefit of, of all the voters. My one, my one request is that they act independently, not politically, but that they give the same effort, consideration, and, and, uh, and, and considerations to voters throughout the county and the state. Can't concentrate on a heavily down county vote. You gotta consider the farmer in Damascus as well as the, uh, the civil servant in Silver Spring. You have to treat everybody the same. Even though some areas have less voters, their vote is just as important Absolutely. as someone in Silver Spring. Absolutely. So and I just want to second the, the vote of confidence for Jared as well. I have him on speed dial. He's an excellent public servant, and I think he's going to do well in his new position. Actually, I'll, I'll agree with that. He's great. He has been the person who is the campaign finance go-to guy 
and is a great resource, but he also calls them right down the middle. But let me stir things up. We've had a little too much agreement. So let's go to uh, uh, voter ID. So 35 states require uh, showing an ID before you vote. So Marise, uh, we don't allow that. We don't require that in Maryland. It would be a legislative decision, not one by the Board of Election or the Board of Election. But uh, how about it? Why not have a voter ID? I am and have always been a champion to um, make it as easy as possible for folks to vote. Um, and I have, like I said uh, earlier, I have a 100% confidence in the system that we do have. Um, you know, I think when it comes to just giving your address and your uh, date of birth, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's obvious that individuals, as they're appearing in the system anyway, that that's enough to prove that they are who they say they are. Uh, and we also have our own protections within the MVA um, and, and otherwise to be able to um, identify, um, you know, any kind of fraudulent voting, et cetera. So um, I, I don't think that we need to add any more obstacles. I think uh, on the contrary, we should make it as easy as possible for folks to be able to vote. Now, Jim, I wish I had a nickel for every time you got asked the question, why don't they have voter ID and you had to explain, but how about it? Do you think the legislature should change that or keep the system as it is now? I think there should be some kind of ID required. It doesn't have to be a driver's license, but we can create, we can be creative and give everybody some form of ID that's acceptable. I, I agree with that. But my main concern, and I've whistled this tune for the six years I was president of the board. Mail-in voting is the voting of the future. You know, in, in the election between Trump and uh, Biden, when, when uh, they first ran against each other, uh, and the second time too, we had about 540,000 votes cast in the county for president. On election day, when you woke up, 500,000 votes had already been cast. Only 40,000 or so voters showed up on election day in our county to vote for president. So the overwhelming uh, way to vote is mail-in. Now here's the problem, and it's a big problem in my view. When Mark Ungerfer requests a mail-in ballot, we send Mark Ungerfer a mail-in ballot. And then, Mark Ungerfer at some point sends in his mail-in ballot. The problem is when we get Mark's ballot, we don't know it came from Mark. In other words, there's no, no way that the board knows that Mark Ungerfer mailed in the ballot. We know he got it, but we don't know he sent it. And there's gotta be some mechanism for us to check the signature, or some ID requirement that we count your mail-in ballot, but we know it's from you. Or is it from your niece who picked it up on the table and voted and mailed it in? We, we don't know that. And that's a big problem because mail-in balloting is the future and the bulk of our votes. So that, that to me has to be fixed. Well, uh, let's sh shift gears here and, and talk about uh, public safety. And, and Montgomery County has seen an increase in crime. And, and one of the categories that's up has been carjacking. May I say the county police is trying to increase the number of women in its ranks. What are your thoughts about those efforts? Absolutely. Any effort to um, have our police uh, force reflect the residents that they're, that they're protecting is going to be a step in the right direction. And women... Um, as uh, MCPD Commander Amy Dom has has been heard saying, you know, women are less likely to be involved in cases of excessive use of force. They are less likely to have complaints filed against them by 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 uh, community members, of, you know, um, and also are more likely to to find uh, better outcomes when it comes to um, intimate partner violence and, and, and survivors of sexual crimes, et cetera. So absolutely. And I just want to caution that as we are increasing those, um, um, those efforts in recruiting women, that we also make sure that there's no pay gap, that we're creating the same types of uh, opportunities so that they not only join the force, but also can go up in the ranks in the, in, in the, hier in the hierarchy of the force itself. Um, and absolutely, I think that I'm, I'm thrilled to, to hear about this. And I think that the county is going to be uh, way better served if we have more women on the force. Absolutely. 
So, I agree uh, with that 100%, Mark. <laughs> so, 100%. So let's move on to uh, a DC judge recently ruled that a, a man smoking medical marijuana had to stop because of, of the nuisance factor. Uh, basically, it was interfering with, with, a, uh, with a neighbor. So this is a secondhand smoke issue. Um, what are your thoughts, Jim? Is, is, should we have the same rules uh, should, for secondhand smoke? How should we apply that? Well, you, you know, smoking marijuana is basically legal. But right. however, if your conduct doing that or something else affects others, then I, I would agree with the judge that if your conduct affects your neighbor or others, then there should be some rule uh, for that person to stop it or at least mitigate the fact that it goes next door. Uh, but if it doesn't affect your neighbor or anybody else, you're free to smoke as much pot as you want in your own apartment. So let's but take it. Others. So, Marisa, let's take it one step further. One of the issues that's come up with the county council is whether or not police officers should have uh, permitted or allowed or encouraged to stop people in cars where they suspect smoke, uh, that pot smoking is taking place. Now, there's a, a trade off between the fact, as, as Jim mentioned, there's decriminalization, but on the other hand, you can perhaps have driving while impaired. How do you set that balance right? Absolutely. Um, and this is coming from, you know, a, a liberal here. Um, so I think here you have you have two balancing acts. First is obviously public safety. And the other um, is just being equitable and making sure that we're not profiling folks. Right. So under the driving while impaired laws, um, it's my understanding that, you know, pot is part of that as well. Now, there has to be an underlying, um, you know, traffic violation or some kind of probable cause that the, the impaired driving is obviously, you know, creating some kind of a public safety issue. So I don't disagree with that. I think that, um, you know, it's part of the growing pains. We will see more, um, you know, ac actions in the courts and in the legislatures as well. And I think as, you know, our society becomes um, more savvy as to, you know, how to spot, you know, pot, uh, you know, driving while, while high, et cetera, and the technology catches up, then we are, our police force and our law enforcement authorities will have uh, the wherewithal to be able to um, accurately identify when it is act when it is just and fair to stop someone because uh, they're suspected of uh, driving while impaired because of um, the, the effects of marijuana. Well, thank you. When, when we come back from this short break, we'll talk about public education and the Kerwin Blueprint. Well, welcome back. Public education is, of course, one of the major public services that uh, is performed by county government, but there's also, of course, a state responsibility as well. And Maryland has undertaken an ambitious, multi-year and expensive commitment in the Kerwin Blueprint to improve that. Now, State Education Superintendent Chaudhry has come under fire for not sharing performance data. Uh, this particular was called out in uh, the city of Baltimore. And Governor Moore actually has been critical of the way that was handled and, and made the observation that, quote, we need, we've got to do better when it comes to being able to present accountability and transparency of results. Jim, do you think we need new leadership from the state to implement the Kerwin blueprint? I don't think so. I mean, that's a, that's a legitimate criticism. More transparency is good, not bad. So they have to beef that up, I agree. But from everything I have read and heard about uh, him, uh, he does a good job. You know, is he, is he perfect? No, but he's new. So let him grow in the job. In this state and, it's, and in this county especially, nobody will be viewed by the public as perfect. Nobody in Montgomery County in leadership will ever be totally accepted. Uh, but from what I hear, he's doing a good job. Give him a chance, increase in transparency, and let, let's move forward together. There's always the nitpickers, but uh, the majority of the public, I think, supports him. The nitpickers, yeah. <laughs> Marise, Mer in order to maintain support for Kerwin spending, and of course, it's a multi-year commitment, how important is it to be able to demonstrate progress on the metrics? It's it's really really important, and as a um, you know former legislator that was, you know I sat in these hearings, etc. Um, I have a, a personal interest in seeing that the public does grow confident of Blueprint, especially because we're going to be spending three point eight billion dollars. Um, you know it's going to be an increase in the budget for the next ten years. So you know we are we should be held accountable um, to our taxpayers. 
Um, and I believe that, you know, the, the Moore and Miller administration, the transition team, they have seen, they've identified, you know, some um, key, um, I guess, some, some key aspects of, of the blueprint that they want to make sure that is prioritized, you know, immediately, such as ch childcare, um, interventions for struggling learners, um, also resources for our special education um, students, and obviously teacher salaries. So I think that anything that's going to bolster the public's confidence, and then it's also going to allow us to, um, um, you know, actually perform on the promises of the blueprint. I think obviously the data is absolutely important, and I and I'm really proud. I know that it's a growing pain. We're we're getting there, but I'm 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 proud that the state of Maryland is leading on an equitable school reform program. And the only way that we can actually prove that it's working is by uh, a concerted effort that our, that our, you know, that our children, that our vulnerable, et cetera, you know, black and brown students are actually doing better. And as a former ESOL student myself, again, this is something that I'm, you know, I'm very passionate about and I'm, I'm very happy to see that we are um, honest with ourselves that where we, are, where we where we do need to see improvements. Well, uh, a recurring, flashpoint in education policy through the years has been the role of parents in determining the curriculum for their children. Uh, and that's especially true when uh, value, there are value-laden topics. Now, recently, uh, Council Member uh, Kristen Mink attracted some national coverage uh, when she told some Muslim t children that they were, quote, on the side of white supremacists. And she was reacting to Muslim families that were com complaining about MCPS's policies. And uh, this had to do with uh, some of the curriculum is issues for uh, uh, gay and lesbian books. Um, now, let me just kind of raise the question. Uh, Maris, was she being too harsh in that? Rather than, than um, opining on, on how harsh her, her comments may or may not have been, I'd rather speak on the actual constitutionality as to why when, it, when, it, when you're dealing with uh, religious or sexual orientation um, curriculum, that you know, why is it that parents do or do not have the rights? And I think that it's, it's a very interesting uh, debate in that as we're become, creating a more inclusive curriculum that then that how somehow is also um, you know going into the, 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 the diversity in the faith that we see especially in Montgomery County and so uh, you know we already know of, of at least six other states other than in addition to Maryland that have uh, brought in the LGBTQ curriculum and mostly from the social science perspective and the in the, in the, in the history or also the um, I guess the the contributions of LGBTQ leaders. So I think I think right now the 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 big question is about when is it appropriate at what age and the grades. And I think that as um, you know as the nation grapples with this issue and we become more savvy around this, that I think that you know we will evolve um, to to into a place where you know individuals will feel I guess. Um, heard because there is there is a debate here. There is a debate here, you know, because if somebody's faith is is to telling you something, uh, and that is in, in complete um, contradiction with what's going on in the schools. I mean, there is there is some kind of, and I, I think you know this is going to be something that I, I I see it coming up into the Supreme Court and you know just federal courts in general. So Jim, let me turn to you. Do you think that MCPS adequately respects the diversity of? Um, uh, sort of philosophical perspectives that families have? Overall, I do. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult topic. And by the way, let me throw in that the Muslim faith is a beautiful faith. And uh, my friends and the uh, people that I know, they care as much about educating their children as any group. Uh, they're wonderful people and education is a priority to them. Parents have a seat at the table. That's a must. And certainly if there's something that they don't want their children to be taught, there should be some uh, orchestrated opt-out for a parent not to allow their child to be exposed to certain topics, not to math and science, but in a, in a reasonable opt-out option that their child would be protected from some of this, uh, some of these topics that are offensive to many, both religious-wise and morally. So I think that's important. Uh, Parents know what's best for their child, and they need a seat at the table to participate in curriculum and other issues in school. But certainly, uh, you know, I defer to the educators and the professionals, uh, but parents should have opt-out options 
And we have to lower the heat and the rhetoric in this because every parent loves their child and every educator is dedicated to helping their children. So we're all on the same page. But the rhetoric is political and it's at times disgusting. So we have to defer to the educators with the participation of, of parents and work together. So Marissa, one of the challenges in all of this, of course, is, is the you know parents getting access to the curriculum in the broad context. Sometimes there's a tendency for sort of isolated things to be taken out of context and, and, and blown up. Uh, and and as, as, as Jim describes, that can kind of lead to sort of miscommunications. So how do we manage that process in which parents kind of learn about the curriculum and then make the kind of decisions that we're describing? Well, that's a million dollar question. I guess parent participation is also a, a privilege given uh, just the different time constraints, you know, who is informed uh, enough to know about, you know, when are these forums happening and are, you know, the participation on the PTAs, et cetera. Um, I think I think that the blueprint does provide um, for at least some language um, accessibility, et cetera. But I think that that's you know I think that's a a, a huge endeavor, and um, you know any any uh, leadership that we see coming from the different um, the different stakeholders groups would you know would would really help improve the parent participation piece. Because I mean at, at the end of the day is you know how do parents I mean if they're working three jobs how do they even know that these discussions are happening and you know, how do they how do they know when to come in and testify if it's at the local level, if they're going having to go to Annapolis? Um, you know, it's I think that that's a, that's a big question with any any big piece of, of legislation and just making sure that we're hearing from all the different um, parties that will be impacted. Well, thank you. And uh, now stay tuned for parting shots. Welcome back. And now for parting shots, Marse. Well, for the climate change naysayers, I hope you got your face masks on. We have that uh, you know, low quality air coming. And I know that at least um, in, in my neck of the woods, um, my, I guess my productivity at work was affected. I was ready for trial um, and uh, the immigration courts were closed. They didn't give me a lot of notice. I knew until, I didn't know until 10 minutes into the virtual hearing that um, my asylum trial was not going forward. So get your face mask ready. Jim? Well, my parting shot is about you, Mark Ungerford. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, in our county, our party, our Republican Party, the 100,000 or so warriors for the Republican Party, we've been tainted for years by some of the characters on the federal level, some of the characters that our party has run for top office in our state. But our local party is a, is a well-meaning, moderate, basically, party that does a lot of public good and led by people like Mark Ungerford. So Mark, thank you for your leadership. You have been treasurer and chairman of the Montgomery County Republican Party. You're now one of the highest officials in the state party as secretary. Uh, you've always been active and a participant for good reason and the standards and principles of our party. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I'm afraid we're gonna have to moderate the color on this uh, because I'll be <laughs> blushing so much. Uh, but thank you for your very kind remarks. And thank you for tuning in each and every week for Montgomery County's hardest hitting talk show, 21 This Week. <laughs>